Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine, the Episcopal Cathedral in the city and diocese of New York. And this is a house of prayer for all people. So all people are welcome here. As my friend Michael Curry says, sometimes all means all. So whoever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you think of yourself or don't think or other people, but you're welcome here. You're in God's house, you're home, you're safe, you're loved. And welcome to this living memorial in honor of the life and gifts and presence of Toni Morrison. Ms. Morrison and her prodigious talent are part of the abundance with which God blesses the world we inhabit. Can't you just see the abundance in her life and work? She used the fire of her abundant God-given gifts to touch millions of lives in so many ways. And here we are as a small token of that. She broadened our horizon and she elevated our sights to a higher vision. She confronted prejudice with the power of truth-speaking wisdom and thereby gave voice to those who had no voice. She propelled us forward in our journey toward reconciliation and hope. She refreshed our spirits and entertained our souls. She enlivened our imagination and she gave us courage. She showed, she showed us in simple and strong ways what it means to be a human. For all of these and more, we, the recipients of the beauty of her graceful presence, can only be thankful as we gather today to remember her life, to mourn her absence, and to celebrate her continuing presence. Thanks be to God. I now call on Errol McDonald. Good afternoon. On behalf of Toni Morrison's family and Penguin Random House, I have the honor of welcoming and thanking you for coming out to represent, as it were, and in full force, it appears. And of course, gratitude and respect galore to the speakers and musicians gracing this fete. About a month or so ago, the United, the United States Senate, in a rare show of bipartisanship, approved the resolution honoring Toni Morrison's life and legacy. Put forth by Sherrod Brown and Rob Portman, Democrat and Republican, respectively, of Ohio, where Tony was born, the resolution pointedly includes Tony Morrison in the patriarchal American literary canon, citing Hawthorne, Melville, Twain, Emerson, Whitman, and Faulkner as her peers. But Tony Morrison transcends this well-intentioned if parochial commendation. She is no mere great American writer. A free artist of herself, she is a world historical figure, a towering presence in the world republic of letters who has had a seismic impact on the global economy of literary prestige. So it is that we have gathered in this house at this time to offer a collective praise song in celebration of Toni Morrison's life, a life ever more about to be as generations today and to come read her work. Let's all rejoice as we extol the richness of her personhood, the sublimity of her art, the exceptionalism of her stature, and the power 
of her moral imagination. To have the chance to remember Toni Morrison is a real gift, so thank you, Errol, and it's a deeply humbling one. Toni Morrison's earliest work did not reach a wide audience, not right away, but it's fair to say that with time, the world caught on. You could stock a good-sized warehouse with all the prizes and certificates and honorary degrees and medals that came her way but she kept the very best of it in her guest bathroom. Two framed documents, one near the sink and the other nearby. The first was her Nobel Prize diploma as bestowed in 1993 by the Swedish Academy. The second, the second was a letter dated 1998 from the Texas Department of Criminal Justice announcing that her novel, Paradise, had been banned from the state's prisons. Paradise, the Texas authorities declared, quote, contains materials that any reasonable person could construe as written solely for the purpose of communicating information designed to achieve a breakdown of prisons through inmate disruption, such as strikes or riots. Think of it, the idea that a novel could cause an uprising. And as Tony once put it, smiling, how powerful is that? Powerful is one way to describe Toni Morrison. Her presence, her talent, her voice were and remain unforgettably powerful. And as much as any artist of her time, she shaped how we thought, how we felt, what we read, what we teach, how we see each other, and how we see this troubled country. It is, as I say, a very humbling thing to speak about her and her immense legacy. It was, so, it was certainly a humbling thing to call her on editorial business. I once rang Tony to see if she might write something for the magazine. She seemed not to care very much about my editorial desperation. I can't, honey, she said. I'm baking a cake. <laughs> now, how long it takes to bake a cake was not something I was prepared to ask her. <laughs> she knew the score. Toni Morrison began her life in letters as an editor. She did it to pay the bills, but she also found a way to bring honor originality and political purpose to that job. She respected protest, but she did not march. She edited, and that was for a time her political work. She published a revolutionary almanac called The Black Book, a kind of family scrapbook of 300 years of American black life. And she brought to life anthologies of contemporary African-American and African literature, work that had helped to shape her and that she wanted you to read. She brought forward the work of Gail Jones, Tony Cade Bambara, Angela Davis, and a gifted and original young poet named Muhammad Ali. Editing was a job, but it was also her activism, her community work. And yet in those days, Tony's most profound work was furtive. It took place at home in the dark, beginning at four, five, six in the morning, while her young sons were fast asleep. She knew precisely what she wanted to do. She wanted to write about black people, for black people, in the language or the various languages of black people. And this struck her as no more or less peculiar than Tolstoy, who wrote in Russian, about Russians, for Russians. And as a reader, she noticed long before most academics how black people were barely visible in nearly all of the novels of the American Renaissance, in Poe and in Hawthorne. She was determined to assert the primacy, the complexity, the specificity, the pain, the beauty, and the endurance of African Americans. 
and not have to go about explaining it all, all the time, to anyone else. White readers were welcome, of course, just as French readers were welcome to Tolstoy. But as she told her good friend Hilton Alls, my sovereignty and authority as a racialized person had to be struck immediately. And so in those stolen early morning hours, she worked and reworked a manuscript about a young girl who was consumed with tragic self-hatred. And her name was Pecola Breedlove. I wanted to read a book about the most vulnerable person in society, female, child, black. And it wasn't around, so I started writing it, she said. And the result, of course, was The Bluest Eye. Then came Sula, then came Song of Solomon, and it was at that point that the artist no longer had to work an office job. She was free. Toni Morrison's novels are not only about subjects, about race and its construction, about family and community, friendship and love, about all that is human. They are also exquisitely built. They're like music. They're as intricately structured as an Ellington suite. Countless passages feature the crafted chaos and the intentional dissonance and dignity of a Thelonious Monk solo. Other passages are as purely melodic and as fearless as something by her favorite singer, Nina Simone. At a celebration of Nina Simone's life 15 years ago at Carnegie Hall, Tony said of Simone what so many readers have come to say of Toni Morrison. She saved our lives. She led us to believe with little true to life evidence to support it, that we could do it, fight injustice rather than suffer it, survive loss, come to terms with betrayal, be brutally honest, disarmingly tender, have regrets minus apology, and not just taste the fullness of life, but drink it down. Toni Morrison was also an invaluable thinker. Her capacity to see this country for what it is, to see our best and worst political actors for who they are, was uncanny. Just after Election Day in 2016, the editors of The New Yorker called on a number of writers and thinkers, among others, to make sense of the inexplicable. It was not inexplicable to Toni Morrison. This time, thank goodness, she was not baking a cake. She emailed back, regarding the future, I am intellectually weaponized. Then she wrote this about the election of Donald Trump. So scary are the consequences or of a collapse of white privilege that many, that many Americans have flocked to a political platform that supports and translates violence against the defenseless as strength. These people are not so much angry as terrified with the kind of terror that makes knees tremble. As an editor, as a thinker, and then as a novelist, Toni Morrison refused to allow racism to overcome her. Racism, she said, keeps you from doing your work. It keeps you explaining over and over again your reason for being. Somebody says you have no language, and you spend 20 years proving that you do. Somebody says your head isn't shaped properly. So you have scientists working on the fact that it is. Somebody says that you have no art, so you dredge that up. Somebody says that you have no kingdoms, and you dredge that up. None of it is necessary. There will always be one more thing. Toni Morrison struggled against the hate, and she was fearless. But she also refused to get lost, to lose her sense of mission. She carried through on the promise and the mission that she embarked on a half a century ago with the bluest eye. Great novelists illuminate worlds we dimly know or they explore new realms of experience that had been sequestered from the canon. That is, great novels either open a door or they turn on the lights. Toni Morrison did it all. She opened the door and she turned on the lights. Thank you.
Soon after my first encounter with Toni Morrison, she became my editor. I probably would not have written an autobiography if anyone other than Toni had approached me. And for me today, the real significance of that book is the arena it created for an instant friendship that lasted almost half a century. I was her housemate for a while. 
According to her, she was also my handler when we traveled together on tour. We were traveling companions both within and beyond the continental United States. We jogged together in Spring Valley. We hiked in the Virgin Islands. We explored Scandinavia together. She was my big sister, a friend who made me feel that without her friendship, I could never have become who I imagine myself to be today. So many of us feel that we have found ourselves through, because of, and in relation to Tony and her work. I was in my late 20s when we met. And although she was in her early 40s, she was not yet Toni Morrison, the internationally acclaimed writer. But she was on a mission to open the US publishing industry to black writers and activists. I wanted to give back something, she later said to Hilton Ells. I wasn't marching, I didn't go to anything, I didn't join anything, but I could make sure there was a published record of those who did march and did put themselves on the lawn. Tony also understood much better than anyone else, I believe, that deep, radical change happens not so much because people march and put themselves on the line, however important this kind of activism might be, but rather because we collectively learn to imagine ourselves on different terms with the world. We realize that we can change along with the conditions of our lives. And that it is the task of writers and other artists to help produce these profound shifts. This is why she wrote, and this is why she published authors like Tony Cade Bambara, Gail Jones, Henry Dumas, who was shot to death by a New York Transit police officer in 1968. Nothing was serendipitous here. I don't remember formalities when we first met. One moment I had no idea who Toni Morrison was, and the next moment it felt like we had been friends forever. I learned so much from Toni the evocative element of perception and language, the expansiveness of the political beyond traditional realms of power, the importance of identifying and attempting to contest the white gaze, the male gaze. But what I value most among all of her many gifts is how she demonstrated a way of being in the world that allowed her simultaneously to inhabit multiple dimensions. She was always here and there at the same time, totally present with you, but also at the same time creating new universes. Many years ago, when her sons were quite young, I was staying with them in Spring Valley. Tony had already written The Bluest Eye and Sula. She made hot breakfast every morning before heading to the city where she would drop off the boys at school and be in her office at Random House by nine. She always began her writing early in the morning but would jot down ideas throughout the day. I remember one morning when she was cooking eggs, I believe. While the eggs were on the stove, she reached for her yellow pad and pencil, which were always nearby, and jotted something down. And again, and again. I remember her doing this when we were driving, when the traffic uh, would come to a halt, for example, at the George Washington Bridge. She was writing Song of Solomon. And all of this time, she had been engaged with Milkman and Hagar and Pilot and the other characters. She was obviously fully involved with them. The book itself is the evidence. But at the same time, she was 
absolutely present for her young sons or while driving or in conversation. She was never only partially paying attention. She was always 100% engaged. This is why I think her vision was so extraordinary. She never drew stark lines separating fiction and the real, and her fiction was often much more real than reality, and especially the current political reality. Tony last visited me and my partner in Oakland a few years ago, and we talked repeatedly of her upcoming visit when we would in California go up to the country to see the night sky, and especially the Milky Way. She was inhabiting one of the characters in her next novel, a boy who loved the night sky. And so I think of her now exploring the infinitude of our galaxy. We are probably all reflecting on the fact that so many out in the world are mourning Toni Morrison and are proclaiming that she is not gone because her extraordinary work fills the, void, fills the void that was created by her passing. But we who knew her, who know her, and certainly treasure her work, for us, it is the greatest challenge to our collective imagination to envision a world without the glorious laughter of our dear, dear Tony. Everyone knows what kind of writer Tony was. Everyone knows what kind of political influence Tony was. Everyone knows what kind of cultural earthquake Tony was. But not everyone knows what kind of friend Tony was. For more than 40 years, Tony was at least two of my four closest friends. <laughs> friends, of course, are the only people in our lives that we actually choose. Family, clearly not a choice. <laughs> Romance, that's not a choice, that's a tropism. But friends, Friends are purely voluntary. Now, one of my other closest friends, who's in fact here today, is a music journalist. And once, when she was interviewing John Lennon, she asked him for his definition of a friend. A friend, he said, is someone who calls you to redo your bad reviews. Well, we've all had friends like that, had being the operative word. I had a friend who used to call me to say, I thought you might have missed this, and I thought you'd rather hear it from me. <laughs> but did you see that awful review you got in the Wilmington Supermarket News? <laughs> Many years ago, I was on a book tour with a book that was doing very well until it got a truly terrible review in the New York Times. Tony was in Paris. I was in either Portland or Seattle. I know there's supposed to be some vast difference between these two, <laughs> but I can never remember what that is. Despite the thousand hour time difference, Tony called me from Paris. Listen, she said, this doesn't mean a thing. This has nothing to do with your book. This is personal. This guy just doesn't like you. What? <laughs> Don't take it seriously, she said. Reviews aren't important. Books are important. You have to learn to ignore these kind of reviews, like I did. Don't you remember when this person said that about me? Don't you remember when that person said this about me? No, I said, of course I did not. So she then proceeded to quote word for word at least half a dozen of her bad reviews. 
none of which, as she said, mattered at all. <laughs> and many of Tony's bad reviews were absolutely despicable. They reeked of misogyny and racism. So what kind of friend was Tony? Tony was the kind of friend who called you to read you her bad reviews. <laughs> but as Tony got older, she kind of lost her grip on her bad reviews and genuinely seemed to shrug them off. This enraged me. How can you talk to that guy, I would say? Don't you remember what he wrote about you? Oh, well, she would reply, it was a long time ago. I don't really care, but I really cared. So I assigned myself the task of holding Tony's grudges for her. <laughs> she found this extremely entertaining, but I was perfectly serious, and I still am. So please, let's keep that in mind. Thank you. When has a voice been this intimate and versatile, affectionate, far-reaching, self-aware, and also severe and dismissive of fools? There's this range of the manner of her voice. She's always full of swerves, from humor to anger to music. We see all this in the narrator of jazz who holds that remarkable novel together. I like the feeling of a told story, Morrison says, where you can hear a voice, but you can't identify it. It's a comfortable guiding voice, alarmed by the same things that the reader is alarmed by, and it doesn't show what's going to happen either. To have the reader work with the author in the construction of the book is what's important. So we are always participating when we read Toni Morrison. During a quiet lull, the narrator will remember, and another damn thing. When in the middle of a flashback, she will pause a gesture. That is what makes me worry about him, how he thinks first of his clothes and not the woman. But then he scrapes the mud from his Baltimore soles before he enters the cabin with a dirt floor, and I don't hate him much anymore. It's those Baltimore souls and the precision of much anymore. And besides, who else interrupts a flashback? There's this constant switching of the formal and colloquial, of perspective and vocabulary, so our stories feel gathered from everywhere. I mean, where does this voice, this lingo, come from? Is it American Homeric? There's a documentary on Charlie Parker, which is a famous moment when he is asked what he thought set him apart from all the other saxophone players. And his reply was simply, the octave, man, just the octave. Do you have your audience in mind when you sit down to write? Morrison was asked. Only me, she replied. I love this faith she has in her own craft. This is her talking to students in Mississippi. As I write, I don't imagine a reader or listener ever. I am the reader and listener myself, and I think I'm an excellent reader. I mean, I really know what's going on. I have to assume that I'm this very critical, very fastidious, and not easily taken in reader who is smart enough to participate in the text a lot. And she speaks often of loving the rewrite, the best part of all the absolutely most delicious part. I try to make it look like I've never touched it. It is this care in her for the gradually discovered story that makes us fully trust her. It is how we are intimately altered by her books and why Beloved would change everything. I did get to meet and know Tony Morrison now and then over the years and what I remember most is her great humor. But I'm really an intimate of hers as a reader. 
So I feel I'm speaking today as one of many writers, some of them are here, who grew up elsewhere, in Pakistan or Nigeria, Trinidad, Bogota, who loved the skill of her craft, her moral voice. She's much more than an American writer. She is universal. Sometimes we find our true ancestors in other countries and become enlarged because we know their essays, their novels, those paragraphs that become us or devastate us so that we no longer remain solitary in that distance. I read jazz for the first time in June of 1992, dazzled by its choreography, how she led us with ease from 1926 Harlem into the history of her characters, how she constructed and then rebuilt the story until there was this fully lit diorama where we could witness the past while we remained in the intimacy of the present. All done by that guiding voice of the narrator, who in a way is the most interesting character in the book. But here's the long range octave, or what Morrison might call the kick. Towards the end of jazz, the narrator realizes that what is happening in the novel is not what she claimed would happen so confidently in the opening pages. She discovers, in fact, that there is a much more, much more complexity in her invented characters than she imagined. I'd like to read this moment when Morrison, in the voice of the narrator, allows her to confess to this misinterpretation of those in the story. I miss the people altogether, says the narrator. I thought I knew them. Now it's clear why they contradicted me at every turn. They knew how little I could be counted on, how poorly, how shabbily my know-it-all self covered helplessness. That when I invented stories about them and doing it seemed so fine, I was completely in their hands. So I missed it altogether. I was sure one would kill the other. I wanted for it so I could describe it. I was so sure it would happen. That the past was an abused record with no choice but to repeat itself. And no power on earth could lift the arm that held the needle. I was the predictable one, confused in my solitude into arrogance. It never occurred to me that they were thinking other thoughts, feeling other feelings, putting their lives together in ways I never dreamed of. It is this confession, I think, made with craft and voice that reveals the vast democracy of vision and humanity in Toni Morrison herself. Good afternoon.
cannot see the river wide, but I can catch, oh Lord, the ocean's morning tide, early rise. I'd rather you're here than gone. There and back again, oh, there and back ha! again. I'll be there and back. that keep on rolling It makes less time For me to walk alone Just to see How this road it keeps on turning Turning, turning, I want to thank God that she keeps on bringing me home. In the beginning, we were stolen. We were stolen from myriad lands, lands verdant with green, lands spread with sear plains, lands undulating with desert. We were stolen as we walked to our wells. We were stolen from our gardens. We were stolen from our weaving. We were stolen from our mother's breasts, our father's hands, our grandmother's lap. We were stolen and forced here. We were stolen from. Our freedom pared down to parts and taken. Our names vanished, reduced to one prime hand, one lady's maid, one cook, one seamstress. Our ease of walking leashed, our feet no longer free to lead us where we willed, chained to the work our will and agency stolen, bound our tongues, garbled our languages, subverted our speech. There were some things they could not steal, 
They thought us not human, so they tried to make us not human. But we did not submit. We resisted. We learned new languages. They stole our songs, but still we sang new ones. We sang even as we toiled. We anchored them with our anger, our sorrow, our need to be free. Sometimes that singing felt like freedom. They tried to steal our stories, but we still told them even as we toiled. We anchored them with our wit, our furtive joy, our defiant love. Sometimes telling those stories seemed a doorway to freedom. Even after the wars, the proclamations that decreed chattel slavery was at an end, there was still theft, redlining, lynching, Jim Crow, bleach in swimming pools, bombed out cities. They still tried in account after account to reduce us to who and what they thought we were in book after book, in film after film, slander after slander, a portly kerchiefed mammy, an obsequious dancing devoted enslaved man, a savage freedman reeling from his broken chains attacking Scarlet O'Hara's carriage. They tried to render us invisible, even to ourselves, but yet we sang. We lifted our voices and ululated to the sky. We scribbled poetry, devoured books. Oracles ascended. We wandering children found them in our childhood, the prophets who called to us their voices high in the desert of the self we wandered, their words loud and carrying on the wind as they sang us to ourselves, as they bought us back to ourselves, as they sang of rivers, of invisible men, of people with the gift of flight. But beneath the stories, the defiant whisper, the oracles hummed this, we are not slovenly, we are not violent, we are not animals, we are not our trauma, we are more and more and more and more. Toni Morrison, regal and wreathed in smoke and flame, found us in the desert of the self. She, profound, far-seeing, and bold, she, of the indomitable octave. We wandering children heard Toni Morrison's voice and she saved us. There was tenderness in her song, each sentence an embrace, evident in how she sang of her characters as they argued and made love and killed and cared for children and fed strangers. How it shone in her patience her presence in her attention. Something in that absolute narrative presence in her sure voice communicated this. You are worthy to be seen. You are worthy to be heard. You are worthy to be sat with, to be walked beside. Even in your quietest moments, you are worthy of witness. This was the melody beneath her words, and we heard it. We understood. We wandering children looked blindly in the dry distance, enveloped by her voice, and we knew. We knew it was possible to write with such careful love, and we also knew it was possible to be loved, that we, every one of us, were worthy of witness. We knew that there was more than this desert, that Morrison's stories, her love, her regard was an oasis. Here was life, 
in defiance of all we'd lost to the thieves. Here we were, here we are. Toni Morrison wrote to us again and again, exhorting us of our beauty, making us grapple with our pain, reaffirming our humanity. Her every word a caress, her every sentence an embrace, her every paragraph a cupping of her hands around our faces that said, I know you, I see you, we are together. She loved us when we prayed and sang and danced. She loved us when we lied and sliced throats and disowned our children. She loved us at our best and our broken. She called us forth in her pages and made us experience and understand ourselves with kindness, with deeper knowing of all we had survived, all we had not, all we had made, all we had unmade, all we had become, all we could be. How she knew us, how she sang us to the world, and now that she is gone, how we weep for our beloved. It is an honor to be here celebrating our genius Toni Morrison, in this august place. This, as you know, is a sacred space, not least of which because it is resonant with writing and writers who, like Morrison, wrote themselves free. It is also, as you know, the space where James Baldwin's funeral was held in 1987, when Toni Morrison offered a eulogy for her friend addressed to you. That day, a group of unknown would-be writers from Boston pilgrimaged here, taking pictures, and what's more, taking stock of what it meant to be a black, to be a black writer, something that Baldwin and Morrison taught. And afterwards, that group of people founded the Dark Room Collective, a group I would later join. I have the wish to not have any other black writer leave us without having met or hosted or hailed them. That desire for community and continuity is just one of the million lessons Toni Morrison taught. It was her voice and not just our losses that sent us forward. I was fortunate to get to know and meet Toni Morrison a number of times. My first in-person encounter with her was during my freshman year of college when I talked my way into an advanced seminar on her work. What a privilege reading all her novels in the order that they were written. It was a condensed approximation of the wonder and wisdom that had greeted faithful readers over the years. She freed something in me. That year, Morrison came to Cambridge, Massachusetts to read from Beloved then newly out. With a standing room only crowd and people sitting in the aisles of the giant Unitarian church, my friends and I literally sat at her feet. Arriving a few minutes late, Morrison passed right over and in between us, clo so close that I could almost touch the hem of her garment. Of course, now and always, we all sit at her feet a year or so later, in 1991, I would get to meet Morrison more personally. I went to the movies with her and Angela Davis, who perhaps remembers, and a good friend of mine who's Davis's niece, Issa. Whenever I tell this story, which I don't do much, but uh, sometimes do, people always ask me, what movie did y'all see? Uh, they picture, I think, something profound and political as Morrison's writing. The Five Heartbeats. I answer. I love that it was that film because up close, Morrison was earthy and funny, smoking afterward as we walked the streets of Oakland. Oh, a bookstore, she said, after a few blocks, and dashed in to ask after something. Through the glass doors, I could see the employees at the help desk looking quite helpless. 
answering that they didn't have this or that title, then staring at f after her in wonder as she simply walked out and we ambled back to our cars. It was like a visit from a myth that you had only read about. The whole while I was still in college, I had my hardcover copy of Beloved and my blue messenger bag, and I was aching to ask her to sign it. I was too shy and didn't know how to broach the subject, exactly because Morrison was so unpretentious and accepting. I was afraid to break the spell. After we parted ways, and for the rest of the evening, and for years after, I felt I had missed my chance. Later, over a decade later, I would get that book signed. She was generous as ever. But more than that, over the years, her own work had helped me to further accept my own black and writerly self, to realize two of her many truths, that, quote, the function, the very serious function of racism is distraction. And also that, quote, the function of freedom is to free someone else. She gave us permission to work, to wake early and stay up late writing, rather than arguing whether we could or should write or exist at all. Morrison gave us beautiful language as an assumption of selfhood, but also as a mirror to look into. I'm thankful that she gave me as a young writer that afternoon to sit in the welcome dark, dreaming alongside her. Today, in my role as the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, my day job, imagine the luck, is to caretake and champion black history and culture in a house that Toni Morrison helped to craft. In our courtyard at Schomburg, uh, just down the hill in Harlem, is a bench in honor of Morrison part of the Bench by the Road project by the Toni Morrison Society. This embodies her wish for a monument to slavery and to memory when she says there is not even a monument, no bench by the road where you can think of slavery. And that was one of the reasons she wrote Beloved, she said. Now that actual bench is a celebratory place to contemplate, to set a spell, as we say, and maybe even to cast a spell. What Morrison conjured up in her writing and in her being is magic of the daily and extraordinary enchantment of black life. It is Morrison, more than anyone, who measures the trauma and triumph of the enslaved, who creates in her work a living monument to our shared past and our far off future, one of words and wisdom, of silence shattered and the unsayable named made legible. She's a friend to our minds. I want to end with a poem by Morrison, one she wrote in her work titled Five Poems, called I Am Not Seaworthy. It's a work of music and mystery, of words that sing. I am not seaworthy. I am not seaworthy. Look how the fish mistake my hair for home. I had a life like you. I shouldn't be riding the sea. I am not seaworthy. Let me be earthbound, star fixed, mixed with sun and smacking air. Give me the smile, the magic kiss to trick little boy death of my hand. I am not seaworthy. Look how the fish mistake my hair for home. Thank you.
Hello again, Ms. Morrison. I've been seeing you everywhere since you surrendered to the air and took your flight. I see you in bleak skies that are as seductive as sunshine. I see you in daisy trees. I see you in benches by the road. I hear your voice in church hymns, spirituals, and in jazz tunes, because you were, as you wrote of Jadine and Tar Baby, not only a woman, but a sound. All the music we have ever wanted to play, as well as a world and a way of being in it. I keep seeing you two in shiny, beautiful hairpins weave through gray locks. Each time you gifted me one of those hairpins, I felt as though you were sharing pieces of your infinite crown with me. I still feel your presence and your sister writer friends who folded me in your embrace and in my own writer sisters, including dear Jasmine. Though you carried a particular strand of genius in every single cell of your body, you constantly reminded us that it is indeed not scarce. This made it so much easier to tremble less in your presence because quiet as it's kept, you half giggled when you laughed and you had a twinkle in your eye when you were in the presence of someone whose company you enjoyed. You drank vodka on a cold day, just the really good stuff, and smoked cigarettes at the Louvre. You were the literary giant that is Toni Morrison, but you were also Chloe Walford, and you allowed me to see them both, for which I will always be grateful. Your work my goodness, the work is sublime. And we do not just read it, we experience it. You gave us both lullabies and battle cries. You turned pain into flesh and you brought spirits to life. You urged us to be dangerously free. You led this foreigner to a different type of home. Your work has carried me through adolescence and marriage, through parenthood and orphanhood. I have recited and paraphrased your sentences to myself while cradling the tiny bodies of my newborn daughters. They get bigger, older, but grown. What's that supposed to mean? And the skeletal faces of my dying parents, soft as cream. I hoped that they would go soft as cream. And I came to think of you, as you wrote in the bluest eye, as somebody with hands who does not want me to die. Death is as natural as life, you wrote, and you sure did live in this world. Some of us called you mother. To you, Ford, she was mama. Some of us called you grandmother, grand. Some of us called you sister, soror. Many in this room called you teacher, editor, mentor. We called you our beloved. Others called you friend, which is no casual title to you because friendship is a kind of religion in your work, including friendships of the mind. We still call you by those names, but now we will also call you timeless. timeless. We now also call you ancestor. Standing here reminds me of that day in your home in Grandview back in early 2016. We had spent the morning revisiting for a documentary called The Foreigner's Home, the month you were in residence at the Louvre. We talked about slavery, racism, immigration, political art, Hurricane Katrina, and hip hop. When it came time for me to leave, it was snowing outside and you were sitting by the window at your kitchen table with the winter afternoon light 
dancing across your face. I leaned down to kiss the top of your head, which was covered with a beautiful black and white scarf. In that moment, I felt the sheer good fortune of already missing you long before you were gone. My kiss on the top of your head created a spark that startled us both with a surge of static electricity from the rug beneath our feet. Goodbye, Ms. Morrison, I said. Goodbye, you said. Then you added, I'm going to rest now. Dying was okay, you wrote, because it was sleep. And Tar Baby, a doubter is told, the world will always be there. While you sleep, it will be there. This is true for you as well. The world will be here, though certainly not as rich and not as full. It will still be here while you rest. And when you're done resting, remember, as another was told through your voice, remember that they are waiting in the hills for you, the hills where the daisy trees still grow. They're all waiting for you, your mother and your daddy, your beautiful son Slade, your sister Lois, Jimmy Baldwin, Maya Angelou, Nina Simone, and so many others. They are all waiting in the hills for you. Go there and choose them after your well-earned rest. There have been a, um, a lot of personal reflections on uh, Toni Morrison, and so a lot of opportunities for me to be jealous uh, and everything I've heard preceding me, but I don't think uh, anything <clears throat> could make me more green with envy uh, than Edwidge's story of discussing hip hop with Toni Morrison. <laughs> um, I have to wonder what that was like. Was it a Biggie, Jay Z, or Nas conversation? <clears throat> it has taken me some time to truly understand how much I owe to Toni Morrison. What I know is that when I was young, the sheer poetry and economy of her sentences enthralled me. That I grew older, and the sentences deepened for me as I came to appreciate what that poetry and economy was doing. How it gave voice to a pain that was at once distant and close. What I know is I've been rereading Toni Morrison since her passing, and I'm amazed how only now, at this late hour, I have come to appreciate what everyone here must already appreciate, that Toni Morrison was really funny, darkly, darkly humorous. What I know is that Toni Morrison taught me the meaning of grown folks' literature, the kind that, to paraphrase my sister Jasmine, is as merciless with its characters and as merciless with us as life itself. But like a trenchant memory, we are drawn back to that work, and slowly we come to see the lesson that grown folks' literature is trying to bestow on us. Toni Morrison has been bestowing lessons on me for my entire life. To explain what I mean by this, I have to take you back to 1974, before I was born, and into my father's small, struggling bookstore on Pennsylvania Avenue in West Baltimore. If you'd gone in that store in 1974, you would have found copies of what my father considered to be one of the most magical books he'd ever encountered. And that's because this book was all about him, all about black people. And the book was not so much a book as a work of visual art, a pastiche of ancient maps, antebellum newspaper clippings, handbills, quilt work, photographs, song lyrics, and poetry. This marvel was called The Black Book, and my dad had never seen anything like it. He wondered how it could be that the white folks in publishing had brought such a thing to be. There was no author identified on the cover of The Black Book, and thus no way of knowing that this book of magic was not the work of white folks at all. It was the work of Toni Morrison. 
My dad's bookstore was not long for this world, sadly, but the black book was. When he shut down the store in the late 70s, he brought it home, put it in his library, where it sat waiting for his young son to discover. The black book is the first work of Toni Morrison's I ever encountered. It was chaotic to me. Printing fonts would switch on the same page. The imagery sometimes of sambos, other times of black men burnt alive, other times of the enslaved was haunting. I did not like the black book, but I was very much arrested by it. And in an era before smartphones and Google, I spent hours flipping through its pages, imbibing lessons on aesthetics that only now, like life itself, like grown folks literature, are being revealed to me. I think that the principal lesson was this. Black is beautiful, but it ain't always pretty. Indeed, for black to be beautiful, it must very often not be pretty. That beauty must ache, that beauty must sometimes repulse, even as it enchants, even as it enthralls, even as it arrests. So Toni Morrison was with me as a child in my parents' library. She was with me at Howard University when I walked in her flowing shadow and saw her in 1995 give the annual Charter Day Address. She was with me as I sought my own voice as a writer. And she was with me when I published my own work. And she was not there to anoint me or even celebrate me. She was there to challenge me, to force me to remember my lineage, to remember the standard that was set before me by all my literary ancestors, including now the queen of them all, Toni Morrison herself, to not indulge in gallantry, to not indulge in pretty, and to remember that this is not a fairy tale. This is grown folks literature. Thank you. Good evening. I must say that uh, I never, I've been speaking since I was three years old in churches. I'm never nervous or intimidated, but writers are rock stars to me. So to have this entire row of rock stars, I'm like shaking inside. I feel so honored to be in your presence and thank you Errol McDonald for inviting me to be here today. The first time I came face to face with Toni Morrison was in Maya Angelou's backyard for a gathering of some of the most illustrious black people you've ever heard of to celebrate Toni Morrison's Nobel Prize victory. My head and my heart were swirling. Every time I looked at her, I mean, I couldn't even speak. I had to catch my breath. And I was seated across from her at dinner, and there was a moment when I saw Miss Morrison just gesture to the waiter for some water, and I almost tripped over myself trying to get up from the table to get it for her. And Maya said, sit down. We have people here to do that. You're a guest. So I sat down, I obeyed of course, but it was not easy, I tell you, to sit still or to keep myself inside my body. I felt like I was all of seven years old because after all, she was there. And so many others that day. Mari Evans, Sister Angela Davis was there, Nikki Giovanni was there, Rita Dove was there, Tony Cade Bambara was there. It was a writer's mecca. And I was there, sitting at the table, taking it all in. And as I look back, that day remains one of the great thrills of my life. You know, I didn't really get to speak to Toni Morrison that day. I was just too bedazzled. But I had already previously called her up to ask about acquiring the film rights to Beloved. After I finished reading it, 
I found her number, called her, and uh, when I asked her, is it true that sometimes people have to read over your work in order to understand it, to get the full meaning? And she bluntly replied, that, my dear, is called reading. <laughs> I was embarrassed. But that statement actually gave me the confidence years later when I formed uh, the book club on The Oprah Show to choose her work. I chose more of her books than any other author over the years. Song of Solomon, First, Sula, The Bluest Eye, and Paradise. And if any one of our viewers ever complained that it was hard going or challenging reading Toni Morrison, I simply said, that, my dear, is called reading. <laughs> there was no distance between Toni Morrison and her words. I loved her novels, but lately I've been rereading her essays, which underscore that she was also one of our most influential public intellectuals. In one essay, she said, if writing is thinking and discovery and selection and order and meaning, it is also awe and reverence and mystery and magic. And this, facts can exist without human intelligence, but truth cannot. She thought deeply about the role of the artist and concluded that writers are among the most sensitive, most intellectually anarchic, most representative, most probing of all the artists. She believed it was a writer's job to rip the veil off, to bore down to the truth. She took the cannon and she broke it open. Among her legacies, the writers she paved the way for, many of them here in this beautiful space tonight, celebrating her. Toni Morrison was her words, she is her words, for her words often were confrontational. She spoke the unspoken, she probed the unexplored. She wrote of eliminating the white gaze of not wanting to speak for black people, but wanting to speak to them, to be among them, to be among all people. Her words don't permit the reader to down them quickly and forget them, we know that. They refuse to be skimmed. They will not be ignored. They can gut you, turn you upside down, make you think you just don't get it. But when you finally do, when you finally do, and you always will when you open yourself to what she is offering, you experience, as I have many times reading Toni Morrison, a kind of emancipation, a liberation, an ascension to another level of understanding. Because by taking us down there amid the pain, the shadows, she urges us to keep going, to keep feeling, to keep trying to figure it all out with her words and her stories as guide and companion. And she asks us to follow our own pain, to reckon with it, and at last to transcend it. And while she's no longer on this earth, her magnificent soul, her boundless imagination, her fierce pa passion, her gallantry, she told me once, I've always known I was gallant. <laughs> Who says that? Who, who even knows they are gallant? Well, her gallantry remains always to help us navigate our way through. I'd like to close the evening with an excerpt from Song of Solomon. You know, I have many favorite passages when it comes to Tony's body of work, one that you just shared, Kevin. She's a friend to my mind from Beloved. I love that. Mama, did you ever love us? and the mother's response in Sula. But this one from Song of Solomon, Solomon never fails to inspire awe for me. And for that and so much else, I say thank you to the singular, monumental, gallant writer. He had come out of nowhere, as ignorant as a hammer, 
and broke as a convict. Did nothing, nothing, but free papers, a Bible, and a pretty black-haired wife. And in one year, he leased 10 acres. The next, 10 more. 16 years later, he had one of the best farms in Montour County, a farm that colored their lives like a paintbrush and spoke to them like a sermon. You see? You see, the farm said to them, see? See what you can do. You see? Never mind you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind you born a slave. Never mind you lose your name. Never mind your daddy dead. Never mind nothing. Here, this here is what a man can do if he puts his mind to it and is back in it. Stop sniveling, it said. Stop picking round the edges of the world. Take advantage. And if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here. We live here. On this planet, in this nation, in this county. Can't you see that? Can't you see? We got a home right here in this rock, don't you see? We got a home in this rock, and if I got a home, you got one too. So grab it. Grab this land. Take this land. Hold this land, my brothers. Ain't nobody crying in my home. I want you to take this land Make it, my brothers. Shake it, squeeze it, turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it, kiss it, whip it, stomp it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent it, buy it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass it on. You hear me? Do you hear me? Pass it on. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my Uncle Andy took a little spill before this celebration started, but he still wanted to honor Miss Morrison, so we just beg your patience and the beautiful energy that you have given us during this whole beautiful celebration. Ladies and gentlemen, Andy Bay. Heaven 
found her yet. She's a big affair I cannot forget. Somebody I'm longing to see Some girls think of as handsome But to her heart I'll carry
Thank you. Thank you for your presence in praise of Toni Morrison. Thank you for the glow of your passion. Godspeed and good night. Please remain seated. Will the Morrison family and the speakers and, and musicians please join me in the back.